So today's message is called put the rumor to rest and I'll move you guys a little bit over here. I guess I might have to kneel <laughs> or sit. Who knows? Who knows which way I have to do this? <laughs> All right. And Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven, and there was a thick darkness over the land of Egypt, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings, Exodus 10, 22 to 23. Years ago, Satan started a rumor. He told a few Christians that they had to live like the world, sharing in the, all the same misfortune, defeat, poverty, and failure around them. Well, the word spread. You may have heard that rumor yourself, but I'm telling you right now that it is a crafty lie. The Word of God says in Psalm 91.10 that evil can't even come near your house if you're abiding in Him, as in Yeshua, as in God, as in Holy Spirit. In John 16, Jesus Himself says that He has deprived the world of power to harm you. And Exodus 10.23 says that when thick darkness surrounded the Egyptian, the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. By these and other scriptures, you can see that God never intended you to experience all of the junk that the world suffers. He's always wanted his children to live above it, to stand out as light in a dark world. In the Old Testament, God framed, uh, God's fame was established because of the miracles he had worked for his children. The same thing should be true today with you and me. I, I kind of disagree. I don't think it's only because of the miracles. I think it's love. I think that's really what it comes down to. We should be glorifying God by the miraculous, victorious lives we live and sacrifice. People should be coming up to us and saying things like, I've heard how God healed you, or I've heard how your children were delivered from drugs, or God has really brought you out of a financial crisis. Can you see why Satan would spread a rumor that would make you believe that you have to suffer with the world instead of live victor over it? He doesn't want people running after you, asking you where you get the power, your peace, your health, and prosperity. But that's exactly what God wants to happen. So put the word of God to work and dare to receive the blessing he has promised to you. Let the light of God's power in your life put the devil's dark rumors to rest. Scripture reading is Philippians 2, 1 to 16. And I will just pull that up here. And like I said before, that's all that witchcraft is as far as cursing and spells go. Bad word. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. You hear that? We're commanded to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I'm sure we can all find moments in our life where we have. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, not talking about relationships, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Prayer is not to be used to your own advantage. The Bible is not to be used to your own advantage. None of it is to be used for your own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on a cross. A lot of Jews are put on crosses, not just Jesus. Jesus wasn't the only Jew put on a cross. That every knee of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's verse 11 here in Philippians. This next section is really good. It's do everything without grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. 
He's acting inside of you to fulfill a good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. How often do we grumble and argue? We need to repent for that. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just take uh, control of our tongues, Father, that we would not argue and we would not grumble. Father, we are commanded to walk in peace, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. What is grumbling and what does, what does arguing do? It changes your mindset. It means the world's against you. Everything's against you, right? But guess what? If you look on the other side, God is for you. He's not against you. He is for you. And when he is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. So we just need to remember who's for us. As you hold firmly to the, to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When the day of Christ finally comes, you'll be able to boast. You did not, did not run or labor in vain. It wasn't in vain. But the world will tell you that this whole Christ thing is in vain, you know? What if he doesn't exist? What if it isn't real? What if it all is just made up? Well, then it would be in vain, and the scripture wouldn't be truth that it, compla that it, that it claims to be. I find it interesting that when they say there's no historical evidence, they find cities, locations, kingship, and historical evidence found uh, in the Bible in our earth. So obviously there's some tangible truth here to the Bible. Some truth, right? But the Bible claims to be all truth. So I'm going to read to you the uh, commentary for Philippians, and I'll pull that up here. This is Philippians 2, 1 to 6. So sometimes I pull this up ahead of time so you guys don't have to see me flip. But that's okay. What's devotions? It's flipping. And yes, we live in a world of ADD. <laughs> I'm sure reading... Reading the Bible is hard enough for people dealing with ADD, but God can conquer that too. Uh, Philippians, Philippians. 2012. Whoa. It's getting closer to, to our year. That's the year of my vehicle. Just in my Bible, it's 2012. I've been listening to a lot of Lecrae lately, and he did a song with John Legend, which is kind of cool. You know, I don't know. I don't know if these guys are really Christian or just using it to their advantage or what, but I think it's really nice because the word of God's being spread. So, two, one to five. Many people, even Christians, live only to make a good impression on others or to please themselves. How many people do you know go to church just basically to please themselves or make themselves look good, right? But don't don't look at <laughs> don't look at them. And their faults, look at Christ and what he's calling you to do, right? And we can pray for those people, but but God's the one who makes the change. Not We don't make the change on other people. But selfishness brings discord. Ever had discord? Guess what's at the root of it? Selfishness. <laughs> Paul, therefore, stressed spiritual unity. Ask the Philippians to love one another and to be in one spirit and purpose. When we work together, caring for the problems of others as if they were our problems... Right? If we if we looked at other people's problems if they were our problems, right, and how much it hurts to be in their shoes, we would probably act and walk a little bit of a different way. Um, we demonstrate Christ's example of putting others first. Jesus, others, yourself, joy. And we experience unity. Don't be so concerned about making a good impression or meeting your own needs that you strain relationship in God's family. Amen to that. Not easy. Hard road to walk. And you'll stumble and fall somewhere on the road, but Christ will pick you back up again. Selfishness can ruin a church, but genuine humility can build it. So God, we pray for humility now in the name of Jesus Christ. Being humble involves having a true perspective of ourselves. See Romans 12 verse 3, that we're undeserving and that everything's given by grace. It does not mean that we should put ourselves down. Right? Don't say, I'm unworthy, I don't belong, because God says you are worthy and you do belong. Before God, we are sinners, saved only by God's grace, like I was saying before. But we are saved, therefore, have a great worth in God's kingdom. Because we are saved, we have great worth in God's kingdom. We are to lay aside selfishness and treat others with respect and common courtesy. Treat them with respect and common courtesy. 
considering others' interests is more important than our own links us with Christ, who is true example of humility. You know what gets really hard? It gets hard when people treat you like dirt. <laughs> like, your situation doesn't matter, right? When you're trying to treat them like their situation matters, and you get caught in that lie, discord. Philippi was a cosmopolitan city. The composition of the church reflect, reflected great diversity with people from a variety of backgrounds and walks of life. Acts 16 gives us an indication of the diverse makeup of this church. The church was included in Lydia, a Jewish convert from Asia and a wealthy businesswoman, Acts 16.14, the slave girl, Acts 16.16.17, and probably a naive Greek and the jailer serving this colony of an empire, probably Roman, Acts 16.25, these are all the people involved in Philippians 2, which I was reading. With so many different backgrounds among the members, unity must have been difficult to maintain. Right? All, all different paths converging. Although there was no evidence of, of division in the church, its unity had to be safeguarded. 3.2.4.2 Paul encourages us to guard against any selfishness, prejudice, or jealousy that might lead to dissension, showing genuine interest in others and a positive step forward in maintaining unity among believers. We can do our best. Actually, sometimes when we do our best, the reaction might not be the best either, right? Because we have to realize that everybody's sinners and everybody's fallen. So even when you can do your best for another, they might still act evil towards you. And then we're supposed to pray for them. Jesus Christ was humble, willing to give up his rights in order to obey God and serve people. Like Christ, we should have a, a servant's attitude, serving out of love for God and for others, not out of guilt or fear. Remembering you can choose your attitude, you can approach life expecting to be served, or you can look for opportunities to serve others. See Mark 10.45 for more on Christ's attitudes towards servanthood. The Incarnation was the act of the pre-existent Son of God, voluntarily assuming a human body and a human nature. Without ceasing to be God, he became human. The man called uh, Jesus, he did not give up his deity to become human. But he set aside the right of his glory and power in submission to the Father's will. Christ limited his power and knowledge. Jesus of Nazareth was su subjugated, subject to place, time, and with other human limitations. What made his humanity unique was his freedom from sin. Right? Christ was blessed. He was completely free from sin. And it's through him that we receive our freedom from sin. We need to remember that. In his full humanity, not in ourselves. There's nothing we can do to make our sin right. It's only what Christ had done and his freedom that we can be free. In his fullness of humanity, Jesus showed us everything about God's character that can be conveyed in human terms. The incarnation is explained further in these passages. John 1, 1 to 14, Romans 1, 2, 5, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, 1 Timothy 3, 16, Hebrews 2, 14, and 1 John 1 to 3. These verses are probably from a hymn sung by the early church, Christian church. This is 2, 5 to 11. The passage holds many parallels to the prophecy of suffering servant in Isaiah 53. As a hymn, it was not meant to be a complete statement about the nature and work of Christ. Several key characteristics of Jesus Christ, however, are praised in this passage. One, Christ has always existed with God. Yes, he has. Two, Christ is equal to God because he is God. John 1, 1. Colossians 1, 15 to 19. Some people will debate that. So you can go to uh, John 1, 1 and Colossians 1, 15 to 19 to show that, that he is equal to God. Three, through Christ is God. He became a man in order to fulfill God's plan of salvation for all people. Four, Christ did not just have the appearance of being a man. He actually became human to identify with our sins. He bled like we bled. <laughs> He bruised. He was pierced, right? Christ voluntarily laid aside his divine rights and privileges out of love for his Father. He loved his Father so much, Christ loved God so much, that he came down and loved us <laughs> to reconcile us with him. He loved us both very much. Six, Christ died on the cross for our sins so we wouldn't have to face eternal death. You know, some people can be very angry at the word of Christ. They might not like hearing that, right? But it's it's good to know that he loved you so much that he did all of this out of love for you. And that, that helps to soften the heart in that area where you think, 
oh, Christ is just being selfish in this in this area, just to be bossed around and to be held down by laws and legality and to have no freedom in life. You know, Jesus wanted to set you free. It says so in the scripture. And it also says that he did out of love. And who would die for his brothers and sisters except out of love? God glorified Christ because of his obedience, number seven. And eight, God raised Christ to his original position at the Father's right hand, where he will reign forever as Lord and Judge. You know, I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't say, maybe I'm wrong to say this. Christ didn't earn his position to be at the right hand of the Father. He was already at the right hand of the Father. He just went back to his position at the right hand of the Father. There we go. Amen to that. How can we do anything less than praise Christ as our Lord and dedicate ourselves to his service? Often people excuse selfishness, pride, or evil, claiming their rights. It's my right to feel this way. It's my right to feel angry. It's my right to be bitter about this person. It's my right. They trampled on my rights. What rights do we really have <laughs> at the end of the day? What great thing have we done that we deserve all these things? Nothing. We've done nothing in compared to what Christ has done for us. It is by him that we are given the rights to the kingdom, not by myself. I did not earn my right. It's not my right to have the kingdom of heaven. It's God's gift. It's God's gift. And I receive that gift. It's not a right, it's a gift. Maybe that's a better way to think. Our lives are a gift. They're not a right. They think I can cheat on this test, after all. I deserve to pass this class, or I can spend all this money on myself. I worked hard for it, or I can get an abortion. I have a right to control my own body. I heard that one a lot. I had a lot of talks with friends about that. That That is a life that you're deciding over. You're deciding over a kid's life that has no say, has not yet spoken a word, right? That can't say, please don't kill me, right? Please let me live. Please let me have a life. Please let me have a future. Please let me enjoy the life that God gave me, right? And live it to its fullest. But as believers, we should have a different attitude, one that enables us to lay our, uh, lay aside our rights in order to serve others. If we say we follow Christ, we must also say we want to live as he lived, right? I'm not happy in this marriage, right? I want to leave it. Selfishness. We should develop his attitude of humility as we serve. Even, even when we are not likely to get recognition for our efforts, are you selfishly clinging to your rights, or are you willing to serve? Are you willing to serve? It's hard being a servant. Let's just put it that way. It's hard to serve. If you truly serve, you'll probably be given some of the crappiest jobs you could ever do, some of the dirtiest jobs you could ever do, with the worst tools that you could ever be given to do the job. <laughs> Good thing Christ, you know, he, he overcomes all of that. He overcomes all of that. Death on the cross crucifixion was the form of capital punishment that Romans used for notorious criminals. It was excruciatingly painful and humiliating. Prisoners were nailed or tied to the cross and left to die. Well, sometimes they were just tied there. I guess maybe they just starved to death until animals pecked at them and pull them to pieces while they suffered. Death might not come for several days, and it usually came by suffocation. <clears throat> when the weight of one's weakened... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Ooh. When the weight of one's weakened body <clears throat> made breathing more and more difficult. Jesus died as one who was cursed, Galatians 3.13, like the brass serpent became a curse for us. Snake. How amazing that the perfect man should die the most shameful death so that we would not have to face eternal punishment. At the last judgment, even those who are condemned will recognize Jesus' authority and right to rule. Right? If he really is God, of course we will all recognize. Right? People can choose now to commit their lives to Jesus as Lord or be forced to acknowledge him as Lord when he returns. Christ, Christ may return at any moment. Are you prepared to meet him? We don't really get a, get a choice whether or not he's Lord. He's Lord no matter if we have a choice or not. Work hard to show the result of your salvation in light of the preceding exhortation to unity may mean that the entire church was to work together to rid themselves of division and discord. Division and discord is a, a curse. 
Let's just put it that way. It is sin. It is a curse. It is death. The Philippian Christians needed to be especially careful to obey Christ. Now that Paul wasn't there to continually remind them what was right, we too must be careful about what we believe and how we live, especially when we are on our own. In the absence of cherished Christian leaders, we must focus our attention and devotion even more on Christ so that we won't be sidetracked. How much more easier it is to sin when you're on your own? How much more easier it is to do something when no one's looking? But God's always looking, right? If, if there is a God, he would see and know all things. He would know the terrible things before we do it, right? And, and of course, after. What do we do when we don't feel like obeying? God has not left us alone in our struggles to do his will. Actually, just on that last note, whenever you feel like closing your windows to do sin, right? To hide yourself from the world, to do something devious. Just see that as a sign that maybe, hey, that's a heads up that I'm doing something wrong. If I got to close all my windows and do this thing in secret, it's wrong, right? Or it can be. <clears throat> I guess you could bring up praying in your in your closet in secret or do, <laughs> doing good deeds in secret. Okay, so there's debate there. <clears throat> God has not left us alone in our struggles to do his will. He wants to come alongside us and with us to help us. God gives us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He gives us the power to do it and he will help us. The secret to change life is to submit to God's control and let him work. Next time you ask God to help you uh, desire to do his will. So I've had God ask me to do stuff before and I said, God, I don't have the money, the finances or the equipment to do this. And Lord, if you really want me to do this thing, then then that's that's what I need to do it. So please provide that, you know, and then I watch him provide what was needed because it was his will and he wanted me to ask for provision. He wants you to ask for provision, right? Have you asked for provision today? Lord, please provide for, for everything I need this day. Please provide for everything I need tomorrow and this year and the years to come, Lord, even when there's famine and pestilence on this earth. Be my provision, God. Rapture us, God. Take us up to heaven. Take us to New Jerusalem, Lord. The new heaven, a new earth. To be like Christ, we must train ourselves to think like Christ. Um, Pastor said something really cool, and I said this recently too, which is um, my my pastor in, in Surrey, um, Surrey Church. They're called Village Church. There's a village church here in Winnipeg too. They're all connected. But anyways, um, Mark, when he became a Christian, his parents said, you're brainwashed. And um, he said something really clever. He said, he said, if only you knew how filthy my brain was, you would realize that it needed to be washed. And I thought about that, too, when I started to take the word really seriously and just dive in every single day. To change our desires, we must be more like Christ. We need power of the indwelling spirit. 119. The influence of faithful Christians... Uh, their facial Christians, obedience to God's word, not just exposure to it, right? We need to see Christians obeying God's word. It helps to encourage us also to do the work. And sometimes you might be the first one to have to step out into that field and do the work. And sacrificial service. Often it is doing God's will that we will gain desire to see 4, 8, 9. Do what he wants and trust him to change your desires. You know, someone might say, oh, Gideon, you do this, you do this all for yourself. But look, I lose friends doing this kind of stuff, right? Being honest about God or reading the Bible. Oh, Gideon, you're pretty boring. (laughs) Oh, you're talking about Christ. I don't want any of that, you know. So I I lose a lot by doing this, but I gain even more according to Scripture. If it's true, I gain even more by doing this. I gain um, gain Christ in my life. I gain a changed mind, a changed heart, you know washing that filth away, and I gain eternal eternal life with Christ and treasure in heaven. And I've seen lots of people get healed. A lot of people going through stuff. Yeah, they hear it. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Why are complaining and arguing so harmful? Is all that people know about a church is that its members constantly argue, complain, and gossip. They get false impression of Christ and the good news. Yeah, that's a turnoff. I went to church, that's a turnoff, seeing that. It's a turnoff in my family. It's a turnoff. 
not the good news, but all the constant arguing, complaining, and gossip, and false impressions. It happens to us, and we just need to repent to it. Lord, heal us. Belief in Christ should unite those who trust him. It should be inviting. I realized in the hostel that I was staying at that, you know, there, there was a man, and he was uninviting, right? Christ was a, a group of one, you know? It wasn't a group of many. God calls us to invite one another by love and by grace, you know, to realize that we've all suffered and we all have a lot that we're going through. So come, let us encourage one another. So let us lift one another. Let's not encourage one another to sin, but encourage one another to walk with Christ and go, yes, it does hurt. And yes, the tug of war is hard. And yes, the battle is hard. If your church is always complaining and arguing, it lacks the unifying power of Jesus Christ. Stop arguing with other Christians or complaining about people or conditions within the church. Instead, let the world see Christ. Let's just let him see Christ. Let Christ just live out. It's just surrendering will. Just let him. It's embarrassing. I, I told myself at, when I went to Cape and Ray, it's embarrassing that I have to let you, God. Because you are God. I'm not God. And I'm embarrassed by that, that fact. But I have to go through that embarrassment and just go, God, I let you. I let you. You're God with all the power in the universe. And for whatever reason, you've given uh, that power for me to let to let you be God over my life, to let you be God through me. It makes me want to cry when I think about that. But I do, I let. Our lives should be characterized by moral purity, patience, and peacefulness so that we will shine brightly in a dark and depraved world. Does the world feel a little dark and depraved? Yes, it does. You could have all the riches around you and you could still feel dark and depraved. A transformed life should is an effective witness to the power of God's word. Are you shining brightly or are you clouded by complaining or arguing? <laughs> Even just in your mind, is there a lot of cloud in there? It might be complaining and arguing. It might be bitterness. All that stuff might have to be rooted out. God help us. Root that stuff out, Lord. We give it, we give it to you. We surrender it to you. We don't hold any room back, any area back in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let dissension snuff out your light shine out for God. Your role is to shine until Jesus returns and breathes the world in his radiant glory. Yeah, that's, that's a high calling. Dear Heavenly Father, help us with the high calling. <laughs> we can't do it on our own. It's proven. It's proven in your word. It's actually made to be that way. That's why we're constantly coming at, to the end of our hum humanity coming to the end of our ropes because at the end of our ropes is where we find God <laughs> where we're finally set free when we die to ourselves you could ask the world do you want to die they go no <laughs> do you want to die to yourself most people would say no I want to be me I want everything that I deserve I want all my rights that I have earned man I've, I've earned nothing God I deserve nothing. Everything around me is a gift. <clears throat> I think my father basically called me a freeloader this morning. God. Everything I have is not that I deserve. I, I am. I, <laughs> I am, I guess in a sense, a, a freeloader of your grace and your love and your abundance, God, because you have so much to give and you want us to have so much to receive. There's nothing I've earned, God, for what you've given me. We're, we're all freeloaders, in a sense. But we've suffered, God. We've suffered to even get to that point. And there is, there is suffering, there is trembling, there is breaking. So maybe we're broken, <laughs> suffered, freeloaders. And you've taken our sin, you've taken our, our filth, and exchange given us riches. I don't know if any of us hear those words, God, and, and believe it and just recognize the truth of that. I know when we're hurting, we recognize the truth of that, because it seems like when the world's hurting, the church attendance goes up, and then when the world's doing well and they have everything they need, the church attendance goes down. <laughs> we only need you when we want you, right? So God, I'm, I'm okay being brought to a place of hurt 
in my life as long as it's pressured to to faith not pressure to selfishness or sin hurt can so easily become sin god and i don't think that's just me i think that's a lot of people it's hurt that got them into their sin and it's hurt that keeps them there and when you say i want to come and heal all the hurt and pain suddenly there's no more sin devil don't like that <laughs> so god we pray that you heal the hurts heal the pain help us to love those who have hurt us and persecute us and say words that they can't take back but god you wash over that they might not be able to take it back but god you can wash it away and that's again that filth that's in our brain wash it away lord we love you god we do the best we we can but your best is way better than our best so god we we declare that we need your best in our lives more than my best more than my better we love you lord we worship you father you are great you are kind we love our parents god because you love us we love our families because you love us we love our friends because you love us we love those we do not even know or have not even met because you love us we love those who have suffered and have not even earned the meal that we might pay for god because that's what you did for us thank you god that you love us and and you trust us trust us huh that's a good question do you trust us love you lord put all these things in your hands and your heart thank you god and thank you for friends in the name of jesus christ amen all right love you guys i know that not everybody tunes in to to a live broadcast in the middle of the afternoon but thank you aaron and um I know that a lot of people do watch these on their own time or when they happen. And I've seen many stories already how just reading the Word of God really touches people's lives. So that's not of my doing. I'm basically just reading out of a out of a book. But my heart's there to want to do the right thing. Have a good day, guys. Be blessed.